Hey everybody, we're wrapping up day three. Come on inside the Cube. G2 Patel is here, friend of the Cube. Great to see you, man. Thank you, you so much for taking time out of your busy day. You're like a, a superstar around here. I People know. want to take pictures with you. And, it's, um, yeah. it's great to be back on your show, and I, this is uh, one of my staples at RSA. John has big time FOMO. He was texting me, is G-Tubing on yet? I'm like, no, not yet. How's he doing? Ah, he doing great. He's at, uh, he's at Boomy World out in Colorado. He's at Boomy, he needs to be at RSA. Well, he wanted to be here, but he's, you know, he's got relationships there, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. and, and uh, his, he's getting uh, two graduations this week, both bookended. One in Northeastern. Oh, wow. In, in, in Boston. He has twins? Nope. Um, no, but his daughter is uh, Moorhead Kane scholar at North Carolina, very exclusive program. Um, and, and so they matched up. So uh, uh, Northeastern is a five-year program, right? I see. But that's what they do. So he's got one last week. Five years of weekend. college these days? What's going on? It's, it, Northeastern actually- I got mine done in three. They created the, the whole program where you basically take a year off yeah. and you work. You're oh. Like, yeah, right. so that now everybody copies it. Anyway. Let's talk about your world and what's yeah, happening. Aren't we live? It's All amazing. right. Yeah, we are live. <laughs> um, so many announcements going on. It's I, crazy. I, I follow your LinkedIn, and I'm like, okay, wow. That's where I get my news, by the way. Your, <laughs> my your LinkedIn, LinkedIn is your yeah. news source? I got to talk to your PR people. We gotta, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but wow, the HyperShield announcement was. It's pretty epic, right? Big news. Um, and I watched a couple of videos of you describing it, but for our audience, take us through why you're so excited about that, what it is. It is singularly the most consequential thing we have done in our 40 year history at Cisco in cybersecurity. And it, it's not just a new product, it is a completely new way of thinking about security and a new architecture. And um, the big problems that we're trying to solve over there are all related to the explosion of volume that's going to increase in the data center because of AI, right? And AI, the data centers are going to need to get fundamentally reimagined because of, this is a scale proportion of what you're going to need to have processed through the data centers. And there are three big problems that we're solving. The first one is if you assume that the attacker is, has already broken through and is in your system, the first thing you got to do is figure out how do you make sure you contain the attacker and not have them uh, spread internally. So that's through a segmentation movement. problem, is that so right? That's a segmentation problem. Yeah. Segmentation is hard to solve yeah. in a hyper-distributed micros microservices world. We've actually solved that problem through autonomous segmentation, right? So that's the first big problem. The second big problem is the time that it's taking these days from when a vulnerability is announced to when there's an exploit that occurs is single digit days, and I think it's compressing down to minutes, hours and minutes. We joke, Patch Tuesday is Hack Wednesday. That's right, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, and by, by the way, the interesting part of this is, so you might announce a vulnerability on a Monday, by Thursday you might actually have an exploit, but it takes, 45 to, it takes 25 to 49 days to actually have a patch applied to it because the amount of time it takes for testing and deploying a patch and getting it applied. So you've got this critical window, Dave, where you, you, you're exposed as a company. We've solved that problem because in a matter of minutes, we can make sure that we have distributed exploit protection without actually having a patch. So even if the patch takes 45 days, we can have a compensating control applied to all enforcement points within a matter of nine to 15 minutes. What'd you call it, compensating control, which is essentially, you're not fencing that off? Um, uh, what does that mean, compensating so a, control? So compensating control means that if, if, if you find a vulnerability and you say, well, I, I need to make sure that I compensate for that vulnerability by going out and doing certain things while the patch is in the making, I can actually do that. And I can do that uh, in a completely distributed environment, right? And so- And it's automated. It's fully, yeah, exactly, exactly. And so essentially you're creating a, an automated short-term fix until you, so you stop the bleeding. You stop the bleeding right away. And then you can bring in the patch. You can bring you know, in the patch when you want, and if you don't have a patch, because that system that you had didn't even go out and issue a patch, you can now start stacking compensating controls on top of each other. It's going to buy you more time. It's going to buy you an enormous amount of time. Yeah. In fact, you sometimes might not have the luxury of having a patch at all, 
and we will be able to have a compensating control that can become your substitute for the patch, right? right? I, I, we'll come back to that. I got yep. some other questions on that, that's good. Number three. Um, Let me guess. Updates are really hard. I was going to say updates. Uh, updates uh, are hard, okay. right? <laughs> uh, why, why are updates hard? Because usually, most of the times, they happen twice a year. If you look in the US, they might happen at Christmas and July 4th weekend. Right. Uh, why, why does it happen that way? Because you have to bring down the system. It's an enormous amount of heavy lifting for organizations to go out and do an update on infrastructure. Dated infrastructure is one of the biggest risks that we have right now for protecting critical infrastructure in the nation. Because you can't do non-disruptive Exactly, updates, right? exactly. And if you think about critical infrastructure, it's no longer just an inconvenience, right? Like it, when, when the hospital goes down, people don't get dialysis. When the financial services go down, people don't get their paychecks. When, when your uh, water supply goes down, your water is not running in the home. So like there's consequences which actually can cost lives when this happens. Those three things, updates being hard, patching being hard, segmenting being hard, are things that we've solved with this completely new architecture. And the reason we've been able to solve it, Dave, is there's a core set of building blocks that are now available to us that we didn't have before. And uh, you couldn't have imagined solutions like these without these building blocks. So the way I think about it, the analogy I draw is, imagine if Amazon.com was uh, founded in, four, in the year 1475. It'd be an epic failure. Yeah. Why would it be an epic failure? Because you don't have the logistics infrastructure. You don't have transportation. Airplanes weren't there. The PC revolution hadn't happened. The internet revolution hadn't happened. You couldn't have built that company without those core advancements that had happened in society. We now have three of these core advancements that have happened. AI, kernel level visibility, and hardware acceleration. Those three things allow us to completely reimagine solutions for these very hard problems that by the way, we have suffered for the past tens of years and not been able to have an effective solve for this that we now have a solve Sorry, for. Sorry, it was AI, AI kernel, kernel level? Kernel level visibility. And, and I can third? explain each one of those. And um, the third one is hardware acceleration. You want and me so to go into each yeah, one? I, well, I, I want you to tell me about this the extended Ber Berkeley packet filter, which is which fits in there, that's but part of the second one. That's part of number two, yep. which I didn't fully understand. All right, in let, the, me, in the let me start. Let's start wherever you think it makes sense. AI, kernel well, level, let's start with AI. hardware. So, so what's right. happening in AI? Um, rather than going out and having AI being thought of as an afterthought and a bolt-on, we built AI from the ground up in this term that we call AI native. That means when we thought about a defense to all these, these, these problems, we said let's make sure that AI is baked in. Analogy over there, think about an electric car. I don't put the engine in the front, I put the engine as sheet in the bottom because that changes the entire physics of the car, right? That's when you think about building an electric car from the ground up. Retrofitting an electric car would be putting a battery pack in the front and replacing the engine. That didn't quite work as well in the first version, right? So, the first thing is AI native. The second thing is, if you want to go out and protect um, things for security, you have to make sure that you have enough visibility. And in a world where the endpoint is compromised and the traffic is encrypted end to end, you have to have visibility in what's happening on the server, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. if you don't have enough visibility in what's happening on the server, you will not be able to detect malware that's traversing through your environment. What EVPF, which is this technology for kernel level visibility. Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. Extended Berkeley for, yeah. Packet Filter. Um, what that technology does is it actually peers into the heart of the operating system and knows every I.O. operation and it knows every process that gets kickstarted over there without actually sitting inside the kernel. It has a kernel level effect, but it actually sits in user space. And, and that's not a vulnerability. That, that, the fact that it can peer in. No, it's not side. a vulnerability. It is an open source technology that was designed for providing that level of visibility okay. so that you can then prevent from, and, by the way, the company that um, was the co-creator of EVPF was a company called Isovalent, which co-created that in yes. partnership with Meta. Mm -hmm. And companies like Meta, Google, Netflix, all of these folks actually use that in their hyperscale environment. So it can't take action, but it can just, it can watch what's happening. It can see what's happening, correct? It, it can see what's happening, and then what you can do is you can build what you can do around that and say, okay, here's what's happening, so therefore we need to do X, Y, Z. Right. right, right, you take the action. Though. We That's take the action, good. and yeah. so we have built HyperShield on top of EVPF. We've used, EVPF as the core of HyperShield, right? 
And so what that allows us to do, and by the way, here's the crazy part of it, and this is a stat you'll appreciate. EBPF has an open source distribution called Cilium. Cilium, Isovalent is the largest contributor of Cilium. We acquired Isovalent just, yes. just a month and a half, yep. two months mm -hmm. ago. Um, and open telemetry uh, is the open source you know, um, kind of area where Splunk is the largest contributor to the GitHub repo. So of the top three open source projects, Kubernetes, OpenTelemetry, and Cilium, two out of the three of them, Cisco is the largest contributor for. We are extremely serious about open source. We want to make sure that open source can be part of the core foundation of how the world remains safe. And eBPF will be one of the key areas of that. And then exchanging telemetry through Hotel is of course one that you know, Splunk has been very, very committed to for a long time. Okay, so we got AI native, kernel level visibility. And then third one is hardware acceleration. Yeah. Hardware acceleration being data processing units. DPUs, um, okay. DPUs that sit on a NIC where the way that we've actually built HyperShield is it's actually, think about it as security, not being a fence, but it's actually melted into the fabric of the network. Mm -hmm. That means you can enforce this in an eBPF client, which is software, or you can enforce HyperShield on a, on a server, on a DPU, sitting on a DPU, or on a top rack switch. So now you have hundreds thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of enforcement points for security, and you can take security to where the workload is. You have an IOT device, I can take security in front of the IOT device. You have an OT device, I'll take security in front of an OT device. You have a microservice, you have a um, Kubernetes container, you can have HyperShield in front of any of those. What that allows you to do is have a completely distributed architecture that's fully coordinated. And it's, that's always going to be updated, self-qualifying updates. You can autonomously segment, and you can make sure that you have patching that can happen um, with distributed exploit protection through these compensating controls. And it transcends IT, cloud, goes out to the edge, and critical infrastructure, which you brought up before. I think people are realizing, with all this talk about AI and AGI, how exposed we are with how critical infrastructure. And, and the beauty about this is, as you think about this critical infrastructure, and as you think about all of these different mechanisms that are going on, HyperShield is still managed in the same console that our firewalls are managed. In. So you have one single platform. You're not going out and building a bunch of point solutions. You have one single platform, one single way of managing it, Single set of policies that can apply across all of these different kind of enforcement points. What is my pane of glass for this? It's, it's, it's uh, what we call Cisco Defense Orchestrator, which okay. is our overarching pane of glass for all of our you know, kind of, uh, network security um, when, capabilities. When can I get this? August. Available in August, man. Ah, okay. So it's not a next year type of thing. We have had, in 2023, I think I told you this last time I saw you, we had more innovation in 23 than the previous 10 years at Cisco combined in security. In 24, it'll be multiples of 23. And so I think the team's doing a fantastic job. I think they've really um, amped it up. We are, you know, our singular vision mission right now is build amazing products that customers love and they're safe with that they talk to their friends and family about. Because the only way to get technology to hundreds of millions of people is build something that can spread through word of mouth. We're not, we're not spending money on billboards on streets, we're making sure that we're spending money on going out and building great products that customers love so they can tell their friends and family about it. And you've done some other integration, XDR and SIM. XDR you've and SIM together. is another one. So maybe, we, maybe you could brief us on that. So we had a few announcements at this, this event, so our, we are, uh, I think about two months since the close of um, Splunk, yeah. we already have an yeah. announcement of XDR integrated with, uh, with, um, with Splunk's um, ES, Enterprise Security uh, System, so there's some. And the beauty about that is, you know, you can be in Splunk's mission control and you'll be able to look at the analytics coming from XDR, or you can go out and use XDR by itself. You'll see a, kind of a dual mode of operation. Um, and so that's something that'll be, um, um, that, that, that we announced. We also announced identity intelligence being available now as part of Duo. You know, so you'll be able to have 
this identity graph which can correlate data from a user identity, a device identity, an application identity, and then be able to find anomalies, that's now going to be made available during your, um, in your authentication and um, access control mechanism that we have. Um, what are the other um, big, we made m multiple different announcements. Splunk made an announcement around asset, asset risk intelligence and discovery. Um, yeah, I didn't see Gary's talk, but, but I saw some social stuff around it. Yeah. We are, um, two of us are flying out to um, the East Coast to see our, um, um, our, our customer advisory board tonight at 11.30, so we're doing a red eye. Let me ask you a question about the Splunk integration. Was that part of the partnership beforehand? You guys, you know, obviously you're in the market together, or was this sort of a cultural shift or maybe a mandate inside of Cisco to say, hey, we've got to do a better job of integrating key technologies and acquisitions, maybe it's a combination of both. It's not just key technologies and acquisitions. The way that Cisco wins is by making sure that when customers have bought multiple different products from Cisco, they're tightly integrated and work in one fluid manner. And so integration will often trump functionality that we build within a particular product by itself. It's the most important thing that we can do. And so when Splunk came in, there was no debate. The teams got together, Gary and I meet every Sunday night at 7 p.m. We actually go through our weekly things that the two teams need to be aligned on. And we're very, very focused on making sure that we have a good execution, like what Gary talks about is a good ground game. We need to make sure that we have a good execution because it's extremely important that our products are complementary and making sure that they're adding value to each other. So observability and uh, Splunk are coming together. Security and observability have always been kind of well integrated. Security and Splunk are coming together. We are actually tying very closely to the network. We have a common design framework across. So it's tightly integrated, loosely coupled. You don't have to buy it all together to get value from Cisco. But boy, if you do buy them together, there's magic that happens. You meet every Sunday. We I meet love every that. Sunday. I love because there's no time. My family is not that happy about it. Yeah, but there's I'm no sure time in the calendar isn't. in the week, and maybe, maybe once you get the groove swing going, you know, it's but, just a good you know. way to get the week started. You know, well, but it's so important because if I understand it correctly, so Gary is on the Chuck's ELT. You guys are peers. That's correct. Right. We are. Okay, because but it's that's so. Important. I've known Gary for a while, and the beauty is you that you guys are friends. Yep, yeah, and and the beauty is that there's a lot of people within the Splunk team that have known the people on our teams for many, many years, and they've yeah. worked together in the past. So the beauty about this acquisition was when we got it together, what, what are the reasons that acquisitions fail? The culture is not aligned, the people aren't quite, quite on the same page, uh, there's too much overlap in technology, we didn't have any of those problems. So the people knew each other, they're excited to win, we don't have that much overlap, the products are very complementary. in fact we have zero overlap in our product lines. And so it's, it's, it's amazing to go out and pull all, the, all of these things together. Okay, you have zero overlap, but you can see how you, you, the synergies between Splunk and Cisco Security, Splunk as a data platform, so uh, the other reason acquisitions fail is sometimes internal politics, right? People say, all right, P&L managers want to grab a piece and you know, friction occurs. It, it sounds like you guys are on the same page. You the, we, we are you know, I, I, going to I, war together. Right now, I think the, 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 the prize is so large and the opportunity is so big and what's happening with AI and how we can actually, look, you can't be a credible connectivity company if you're not a great security company. You can't be a great security company if you're not a great AI company and you literally cannot be a great AI company if you're not a great data company. And Splunk progresses us forward so much on the dimension of data. Last question, because yeah. um, I've been trying to squint through Cisco's AI strategy, I've been listening to Chuck. Chuck's basically saying, hey, we miss cloud, we're not going to miss AI. How would you describe Cisco's AI strategy from a high level? We are going to make sure that we can power um, AI infrastructure from a connectivity standpoint for AI data centers. And so you'll see that with, you know, there's, um, um, you know, the core, communication fabric will be all ethernet and we'll make sure that we can provide great, great, great connectivity because the latency when you actually have packets moving uh, in between GPUs can cost a lot. You don't want to have a GPU stay idle, right? And uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so AI infrastructure is going to be a big area for us. In security, we're going to do security, 
We're going to use AI in our security, like what I talked about in HyperShield, where it's built from an AI native standpoint, but we'll also make sure that we build security solutions for AI to protect AI workloads to make sure that we can actually have, and so there'll be a lot more innovation that happens over there. Securing AI. Securing okay, AI. Yep. So, AI for security and securing AI. Yep. And then lastly, in the application side, we're doing a ton with, um, with WebEx, with AI. Um, we're using that in every single one of our products. And if you look at what Splunk does with AI, I mean, there's, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity for data being used in an effective way to go out Which and is buy. orthogonal to that stack, yeah. right? So you got three yeah. layers of the stack and then data runs through that's it. That's right, that's right. Awesome, thank you so much. I know you're super busy. Really appreciate you thank taking you the time me. with us. All right, okay, this is a wrap for day three. We'll be back tomorrow morning, full day here at Moscone. You're watching theCUBE. Go to siliconangle.com for all the action, thecube.net, everything's on demand, it'll be up very rapidly, all of today's interviews are up there. We'll see you tomorrow.